Hey everybody and welcome to episode number 243 of the Chris Rose Rotation, a production of John Boy Media. I got my Jake's Snakes hat on because we got one of our favorites. He is the closer of the defending National League champion Arizona Diamondbacks. Hello, Paul Seawald. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great, Chris. Thanks for having me on. I just want to I just want to make a public statement as I'm not sure when this is airing, but you know that I really like you, that I'm turning off the US Open to make sure that I can do this today. Well, I was actually wondering if we should both put it on and watch it ourselves. Do you have a favorite this weekend? Well, you know, obviously Chef was the favorite and he kind of he's kind of a little bit he's struggling a little bit, but it's been uh, it's a pretty good leaderboard. I'll take a good leaderboard no matter what. Do you uh, do you run the U.S. Open pool in the Diamondbacks clubhouse? No, so one of our clubbies is in charge of like everything: fantasy football, the pools, uh, the derby, uh, everything. He's on it. Chiff is Chiff takes care of it. So then all I have to do is show up with my money and watch sports, and it's like that's the best version. And uh, how'd you do like in the Belmont Stakes? Obviously, we, it has a baseball tie now that Jason Worth with a seventeen to one horse ends up winning that thing. We feel bad. We didn't even, we didn't do the Belmont Stakes. We did the Derby. We did the PGA, uh, the Masters. We, uh, we, we, we didn't even participate in the Belmont. And then for a baseball person to win, it was like, it's kind of disappointing on our part, but that's okay. Yeah. All it's right. the so Derby you, and well, then everything else. That's true. Good point. Uh, so who do you have this weekend in the U.S. Open? So I, so we have like pools of like tier one, tier two, tier three. Um, I'm trying to think. So I picked Chef because it kind of felt like that was like a guarantee to try and get a top five. That's not going to look good. Um, who else did I have? Um, Zalatoris has been okay. Um, I'm getting put on a spot. I, I picked Chef and he's going to do this and, and half the other guys picked Rory. And so it's like, all right, I'm already, I'm already out essentially before. If he's not even going to make the cut. It's like, it's going to be a tough week for me. It's okay. You'll still, uh, regardless of the results of the U.S. Open on Sunday, you'll still have a great day because it is Father's Day. I know you are a dad. You are yep. also a Father's Day Arizona Diamondbacks polo model. So <laughs> do you have, is is that picture the first thing we're going to see when we walk in the Seawald household? Yes, it's going to be, it's going to be right on our mantle. Make sure everyone can see that amazing shirt. So um, they pulled me off right after I threw. And so like, I'm all sweaty from throwing. They're like, Hey, will you throw this on? And I was like, all right. And they're like, well, we need the, we need dads to do it. I was like, okay, like we don't have that many. I'll, I'll, I'll get on there. And I was like, what do you want me to do? They're like, well, what's the like most dad thing you can do? I was like, all right. I just crossed my arms and gave that like just dad look. And it's just, it's not, it's not my best look. And it's just, it's all right. It's part of being a dad. I don't look cool. Yeah, I already I've accepted that. Well, but that, that that's the best part of being a dad is that you're no long you totally lose your cool factor when you become a father, I think. But you lose the the thought of I need to be cool. Like I don't I don't care about being cool also. So there's part of like it's not a doesn't bother me at all. Got it. Um will you get a Father's Day gift or just a card? So I already got a gift. So we had an off day uh, on Monday and we've had a weird, we've had a brutal travel schedule. So um, that was like the first chance that I've gotten any chance to spend with my family, it feels like. So my wife took us to uh, to one of the hotel resorts here and we just did like a mom and dad spa day and a, and a like relaxation day at the pool and chill. It was, uh, it was very nice. Okay. So when you go to the spa, what is your go-to? Do you get a massage or because you're a big leaguer, you wait until like the people who are supposed to put their hands on you, put your hands on you. Do you get a Manny Petty? Uh, do you get a, a facial? What, what do you get? I'm a, re I'm just a massage. I'm a huge massage guy. Cause, but it's more of like a relaxing massage where like, if I go to the trainers and I'm like, Hey, you know, my shoulders bothering me, they get elbows in there and it's like excruciating, but I can pitch better the night before or that night. This is more of like, I just want to just fall into a cloud of relaxation. Okay. Nice one. Nice. Um, I know that both of your parents are accountants. We have talked about that. So every year when you were growing up, did you get dad a new calculator or something for father's <laughs> day? When no, we, uh, the jokes, the, the jokes kind of stopped. Cause it's like, well, that's, you know, that's, you know, that was my plan B. I kind of thought that was going to be me at some point in life. So it was, it was like, you kind of have to take a look back and say, it's, it's hard to joke with your parents when you know 30 years from now, you're going to be, that's what you're going to be. <laughs> I'm uh, incredibly blessed that I don't have to go to plan B and that plan A has worked out really well, but no, 
no teasing them because I, you know, I always figured that was going to be that was going to be my life at some point anyways. I forgot if I asked you this before, but you don't do your own taxes, do you? No, we don't even do. I don't even do my own taxes. My parents, my parents are a little bit like, what was all that money for school for? So, you know, I kind of I owe my grandparents and my parents a little bit. <laughs> Um, luckily they, they enjoy world series tickets. So that's been, that's been kind of like a nice, that was a nice reprieve on the fact that I don't use any of my education. So it's, it's interesting. I think we talked about this before, but, um, when you file taxes as a baseball player, it's crazy because you have to report from every state, don't you? Yeah. I mean, we file in 20, 25 states throughout the, throughout the country. Cause you, wherever you play games, you pay taxes in that city and that state. So when you go to New York, you pay New York City taxes, you pay New York state tax, you know, you pay the Philly, the Philadelphia city tax while you're in Pennsylvania. And so it's like, you know, I took I took accounting classes in college. They kind of get you enough to get a job and kind of take the CPA exam. They don't really go over, um, you know, athlete tax. So uh, I, you know, even if I even if I wanted to, I'm not even sure I would know where to start with uh, with all this nonsense. So we're thankful that uh, that I don't have to really do it. But your parents could do it. My parents could handle it. My mom, the first year when I, in, I think I was in, yeah, short season and I had her, she was like, what is going, like, this is just not <laughs> worth my time. She's like, I would charge you so much if you were an actual client. This is insane. So um, even she rolled her eyes and was like, this is, this is pretty dumb. So um, she does tease me, but I, I think she understands that it's not really worth everybody's time at this point. All right. More of the show is coming your way. But first, I want to talk to you about my best friend, Sydney Rose. That's my fur baby. That's my dog. Literally, that's my dog. And like eight or 10 months ago, we made the change to the farmer's dog food. Her life has changed because the farmer's dog food is developed with vets, made fresh from real meat and veggies, perfectly portioned for your dog and delivered right to your door. It takes about five minutes to fill out a questionnaire on the farmersdog.com. It's the basic stuff. It's the age of your pup. It's uh, the breed of your dog, how much it usually likes to eat, how much it exercises. They'll take that in. They'll figure it out. They send it right to your door in these frozen packets, and it actually has your dog's name on it. So she has ownership. It says Sydney Rose right on the thing. We stick it in the freezer about 24 hours before she needs to eat it. We thaw it out in the fridge. It's very simple. It's not just fresh, high-quality food. It is also great for the health. It's great for the coat and the skin. It's great for the breath of your dog, which is really nice because as much as you love your dog, sometimes that thing can be like a fire-breathing dragon out there. And it helps with their digestion. It makes for better poops. If you're a dog owner, you know what I'm talking about. So make sure you have all the benefits when you head on over to thefarmersdog.com doesn't matter whether your pup is old like Sydney. We think she's 12 or 13. We rescued her, so we're not exactly sure. Or whether it's a dog that's just getting out in the life and is a little puppy. Help keep your dog healthy and energetic. Thefarmersdog.com slash Rose. You're going to get 50% off your first box. Plus, you're going to get free shipping, which is actually a really big deal because it's a big box. It's huge. It's like this. It's not a little Tiffany's thing. It's big. It shows up to your door. So you get free shipping. That's not bad. Head on over to the farmersdog.com slash rose. Half off that first box. You will enjoy it. Most importantly, at the end of the day, your dog will look up at you and say, Ravi, 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 Ravi. All right, we got a lot of fun stuff to get to with you. Um, Tori Lovello recently was talking about the team party that he has had, I think, six of the last seven years at his house. Apparently, it sounded like it's part crazy party, part petting zoo. What what had happened here? This was my daughter's dream come true. So we pull in, you know, we come down the drive, we come down the cul-de-sac driveway, and we're kind of seeing. You see the food truck out front, and then I see, you know, there's a uh, there's a bouncy house play structure, and it's like that's my daughter's already like her eyes are gone. I was like, no, 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 I we need to go to the back. I think you're gonna like what's in the back even more. He had two zebras, a llama, a Scottish Highland cow. And like 12 goats. And I just walked out there like, what is going on? And my daughter's face just lit up. And she, I don't think she's ever had a more fun time in her entire life. She wants, she wants the Lovello family parties like weekly at this point. Well, that's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to drop her off at Uncle Tori's. <laughs> I, you know what her, the craziest thing is she didn't, I don't think she even processed the fact that there were two zebras. Like you don't just. This isn't, I told her, I was like, you're not going to have another party with a zebra. Don't expect this ever 
again, she was like kind of playing with the goats. I'm like, no, 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 you need to, you need to get some quality time with the zebras. Cause like, this isn't the zoo, even if it feels like it. So there's always going to be a teammate who either is scared shitless about animals. And so they don't know how to react around them. Or there's the dude who's like trying to feed him beer and alcohol. Who are those guys? So I think we left before the feeding them beer and alcohol crew really start to get fired up. You know, you have two little ones we kind of left in the middle of the party. Um, we didn't have anybody who was terrified, I don't think. I think when you see, you know, you know when you see seven or eight uh, four-year-olds kind of like playing and, and petting all the goats, if you're really scared of it, that's kind of a really bad look. It's a great call on that. Great call on that. Uh, I want to take you back to spring training. I was just kind of crawling through social media while I was watching you pitch last night, and we're recording this on a Friday morning. And I saw a clip put out, I think it was from your spring training, where a mentalist visited you guys. And he talked to Dre Jameson, who's one of the pitchers, and he brought up your manager, Tori Lovello. And he said Dre's basically going to send a signal to Tori, and you guys are going to like mentally connect. And so we're going to pick this up midway through here. I want you to listen. Okay. You got something, manager? You awake? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what do you got? Tell us. 400. And? 660. Is that what you were thinking of? No. So it's uh, 6,400. And then you said 660? 660. Six, 660. Okay. Could you stand up? What, what were you thinking of? You could have thought of anything. What was it? Doug Dre back. Sorry, I'm Cy Young, so the baseball player, a pitcher, I guess? And you had 6,400, 660, that's what came to you, yeah? Sometimes you see them as images, or sometimes even as numbers, or upside down like that. That's Cy Young. All right, were you freaked out by this? Okay, so there's two, there's two ways to approach this, right? You either are a kid and you believe in magic, or you're Mr. Skeptical and you know that everything, like there's a reason you can do all of these tricks. You know, I got a, I got a, my daughter a mini magic set. Like she thinks it's magic. I know that it's not magic, but there's two ways to think of it. I like to think as a kid that this is crazy and I can't believe he did this. Um, and my jaw kind of hit the floor. And then the problem was right afterwards, everyone was like, well, he did this and this, this, this and tried to prove all the, all the tricks. I'm like, Guys, you either you either believe in magic or you don't. Like, if you're gonna if you're gonna be like half in, you gotta be you gotta be half in, or you gotta be all in or all out on like magic doesn't exist or it totally exists. So everyone was just trying to like break holes in all of his tricks, which is kind of I thought was a little annoying. I was like, guys, just enjoy it. Like, just it was fun. So end of the day, did you enjoy it? I I had a good time. I thought it was pretty crazy. I thought it was pretty cool. So, uh, were there was anybody like uh, okay, this guy is a wizard. I got to get as far away from him as possible. I don't want him anywhere near me, and definitely don't want to be in the same room. I don't think so. I think everyone was a little bit in shock, and then you know, baseball players and their egos were like, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna get down, I'm gonna get down to this. I'm gonna figure out how this happened." Who's who's that guy leading the charge? Gal Gallon was doing. Well, Gallon was like leading the charge. Of course he was. Anytime anybody who's known Zach, he he was obviously skeptical of it. Yeah, well, you know those North Carolina guys. They always think that they, I mean, they, you walk outside. What color is the sky? Carolina blue, right? Yep. So, you know, they're all they're always smarter than everybody else in the room. Exactly. I get it. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's talk about your season a little bit. Okay. It's been weird. It has been, I think it's been weird around baseball because there's like, it feels like there's 97 teams that are all within like a game of the wild card in the National League. How do you deal with that on a daily basis? Well, you know, that's part of what we have created, right? With six playoff teams, you know, it used to be two, well, it used to be two, then it was four, then it was, then we had the eight and now we have 12 or ne then it was 10 and now it's 12. The more teams you put in the postseason, the more teams that are, you know, vying for a playoff position, right? Like the Phillies were so much better than the rest of the field. If you were just going back the old wild card where we had four teams from each division, we wouldn't have even really had a chance and, and. Mike probably doesn't trade for me at that point thinking like, okay, well, we're not going to be able to catch, you know, the Phillies at this point. So you have more sellers, less buyers in that situation. But now we have so many people who are within striking distance. I think it's created a difficult trade deadline, but it's also created a lot of buzz of the fact that like there's 10 teams in the National League and their fan bases are like, hey, we have a chance of making the playoffs this year. Is that good or bad for the sport? 
Um, it's just, you know, I think it's just one thing. It, you know, if you are a Dodgers fan or a Braves fan the last couple of years, you think it's worse for the sport. Um, if you're a Diamondbacks fan, you certainly think it's better for the sport. Playoff, the way championships have worked, championships have never been the best team, right? It's always been the team that plays the best when it matters the most. And that is forever what sports will be. And that's just the way the playoffs work. Um, I do think it's more fun. I think it's more fun for fan bases. I think we should have a different trade deadline. I think that would kind of create more buzz because on, on July 31st, there's still a lot of teams that are trying to figure out where they are and, you know, they don't want to sell because they're three games back with, with two months to go. So, um, you know, we, you know, we, tr we trade it or we move the trade deadline where you can't, you can't trade people after July 31st or after August 1st. Maybe we should look into maybe recapturing that ability to try to trade somebody up until September 1st. Um, because if teams are in it on July 31st and then they're not in it August 31st, and then you get a big, a big trade then would, I think it would bring a little more buzz to the real playoff push in September. But I appreciate that there's more teams involved. I think more fan bases are involved and, and excited about it. And, um, you know, there's nothing worse than on August 1st, you start making your flight for Aug October 1st home. That's a really bad feeling. And um, I, think it's, I think it's fun that more teams think that they still have a chance late. Okay, so do you want it like it used to be where there were two separate deadlines? There was the non-waiver deadline. And then yes. you had to pass through what... You want it, you want it back to that. I think we could bring back that waiver trade deadline. I think it would create a little more extra buzz. I, I'll never forget we were doing our fantasy draft in Houston, uh, my rookie year, 2017, and Tyler Clippard had played with the Mets, and so he kind of came to the fantasy draft and was like hanging with the guys. And Justin Verlander got traded to the Astros during that draft, and Tyler Clippard went nuts because I mean they just traded for an ace. They're already the, one of the best teams in the league. Like you could still have that up until September 1st when, you know, you have to obviously be on a, on a roster by September 1st to be on a playoff roster. And I just feel like we could, we're losing a little bit of that because so many teams are in it. Did you kick Clippert out of the draft and be like, get out of here. We're not going to deal with that now. I mean, we were, we were not very good. We had already made our <laughs> October 1st flights uh, in mid August. So it's kind of one of those things like, all right, well, I guess we're going to, we're going to have an even harder time against these guys. Did you make Clippard sing? Because a uh, little known fact about him, that dude, he can sing. He can sing? I didn't know. I know he's I know he's probably the best golfer I've ever – I haven't played golf with him, but probably the best golfer that I know has played baseball. But I yeah. do not know about his singing abilities. Uh, okay, that's all right. Next time you talk to him, see if he'll sing you something special. Right. Pardon the interruption, but it's the bottom of the ninth. Two outs, bases full, down three. The crowd is on their feet. And the drama of baseball is real. And so is all the action at the DraftKings Sportsbook. From the first pitch to the final out, DraftKings has you covered with same game parlays, live betting, odds boosts, and so, so much more. And if you're new to DraftKings, you got to check this out. New customers bet just five bucks to get $150 in bonus bets instantly. So download DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use promo code ROSE. And new customers can bet just five dollars and get $150 in bonus bets instantly. That's promo code ROSE only at the DraftKings Sportsbook. The crown is yours hate to bring this up, but I think it's part of reality and you're always so honest with us. You are a free agent to be. Yep. The next six weeks, you could be on the move again. Do you think about that? Or are you like, God, Rose, you asshole, why'd you bring that up? That's a realistic thought. It obviously is a realistic thought. Um, we, I have, I have no contract pass when the last day of the season is. So, um, if I, if we are not within playoff striking distance, it's reasonable that I could be on another team again. Uh, my wife and I certainly think about things like that. You know, it's going to be, it would be a little harder to try and move two kids this time than, than one last time. And um, it's a realistic thought. It's, we just have to keep playing really good baseball and, and try and make it happen here in Arizona so that I don't get traded. So um, we have quite a few people on our team that are in that position. So uh, I think it's I think it's a little bit of a motivator for all of us to try and you know pick up our game and and give us a chance to really make something happen in August September when we you know when we get Gallon back we get Merrill Kelly back we get Eduardo Rodriguez back we kind of start to get the team that we had hoped when we got to spring training that we were going to have. Uh, is it something that you guys discuss as a team, particularly guys like yourself and Christian Walker, guys who could be on the move? Yeah, it's not really. It's not, it's just kind of like at some point it's just kind of 
it's not really a discussion, but sometimes it's like, you know, Paul's a free agent after the end of the year. Like if we don't pitch, like if we don't play better <laughs> and it's kind of like, I, I mean, it's, it's just an elephant in the room, unfortunately. But um, at the end of the day, we feel great about if we get the 26 best players in the Diamondbacks organization on the field, we feel really good about our team and feel really good about our chances. We just have to, we have to get healthy one. And then we, you know, we have to play well enough that, that uh, that we give Mike a reason to to keep everybody and try and make a push. Have you guys had any team meetings yet this year? I'm trying to think, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, no, there's been you know we've had a little bit of a roller coaster, but you know Tori's not the meeting kind of person. Um, you know he's he's great on communication, but he's more he like he's really good at doing one on one communication or two on one communication, not necessarily. Hey, everyone, you know, get in the room and kind of look at me and let's, let's, let me see if I can rally the troops. We had one in August when I was here. Um, we lost the first nine games I was on the Diamondbacks nice. and we had them after that night. Um, and then we kind of turned it around, but he's not, he's not necessarily a, a, uh, a meeting kind of guy. What is it that separates him from other managers that you've played for? I would, you know, I say it again, but his communication, he's just, He's a really good communicator. He really understands. I feel like when you talk to him, he's listening. And that's not a shot at any manager that I've had before. I, you know, I've had some very good managers in my, in my career. But you just, feel, you just feel like he's listening to you. There's not, he can't always do everything you're talking about, right? He, you know, he's the manager. He's not the GM and the owner. But um, you kind of feel like he's at least – he understands my perspective when I talk to him about things. And um, we have a good relationship that I feel like we go honest back and forth of trying to figure out, you know, I try and give him feedback from a player's perspective because, you know, it's very difficult. Not everyone feels like they can go to the manager and talk to thing, talk to him about things. And he's receptive, but at the same time, you know, he's understands that he's in charge of the team and what he, you know, what he wants to do is, is what, what we're going to do. Cause he, you know, he ultimately has, has the team's best interest at all times. But he automatically shot to the top, regardless of who else has been your manager based on the petting zoo, right? I mean, he's he's Chloe's favorite. That's for sure. He's definitely <laughs> Chloe's favorite manager, no doubt. Hey, hey man, if you uh, if you do get traded or if you leave via free agency, Chloe might be taking up residence in Arizona. I just want to let you know. I don't. I mean, my family loves it. My family loves it here. I they're going to be like, what do you what do you mean we're leaving? We we got the pool. I can swim every day. We got the petting zoo. Uh, Chloe has all her best friends at the field. Yeah, she's gonna be she's gonna be the saddest one of the group if we uh, if we leave Arizona. So listen, I know that you're you're focused on today. This is the the way of the world in baseball, but you're also a really bright guy and it took you a while to get to the big leagues. So now you have taken on this wonderful role as the closer of the defending National League champions. You've performed very well. You're in your mid thirties and you're about to have your payday. Have you discussed the strategy with your wife, with your agent moving forward, or is that is that a discussion that happens at the end of the season? There was a part of a discussion last off season um, going into my last year of arbitration because it, it was also a point of like, are we going to sign an extent? Like, what would an extension look like versus what we think you'd be worth on the open market? Because it was the first time that it was like, well, you might have to really think about. You might get to a decision where you really have to think about it. So we had we had some brief discussions of kind of what numbers we thought would look like, and just kind of you know, my agent obviously is going to think that I'm the greatest player of all time and. You know, this is your market, which is why I love him to death. But, um, you know, it's just part of the we'll see when that process gets here. Now, when the, I told, you know, I've, everyone knows when the season starts, we don't talk about stuff like that. Like I am just going to play for 162 and whatever happens, happens. And we'll, you know, we'll discuss it after the season. So um, there was discussions last off season in the spring training, trying to figure out, you know, the temperature and try and go from there. But after after we agreed that it's, you know, that we're just going to play this year, we're just going to play and we're not going to worry about it until uh, until November. Have you, however, um, talked it out with your teammate, Jordan Montgomery, who had a really, I, I don't know if interesting is the right word, or rocky offseason, and now he's even talked about it within the last week that, like, I'm letting my team down. I don't think he is, but he feels like he is letting his team down because he signed so late. So have you tried to gather information from him that can benefit you? Yeah, so he came to uh, he came to Salt River when he signed, obviously, because they wanted to make sure that he was getting in, he was getting in rhythm and he had to go to a couple, um, I guess, rehab outings and in, in, in the minor leagues before he, before he got called up. And that was while I was injured. So we had an opportunity to kind of get away from like the game 
game time where life's the most important thing. You know, we kind of talked about stuff. Um, and definitely a frustrating situation for him, right? This is this is our ultimate goal. You all you every baseball player wants to get to free agency so that they get the right to make as much money as they can and pick where they want to go, right? This is the first time in anybody's career they've had the opportunity to say, I'm gonna pick where I'm gonna go and I'm gonna pick for how much money. And when he has the season that he had last year and for free agency to go as poorly as it did for him, I know he was very it's extremely frustrated and Obviously, everyone knows that he he fired Scott Boris and he moved he moved on. And so, um, I know he he felt like he hasn't been himself. I I'm disappointed to hear that he feels like he's letting us down because that's absolutely you know everyone has stretches where they don't pitch well or don't play well. And I wouldn't I wouldn't want anyone to think that they're letting the team down. But um, I understand that he you know him and Blake Snell and some of these guys probably look at the situation a little differently. Like, man, I really maybe I did need spring training more than I thought. So it was a disappointing free agency season for those guys. And, and, you know, I can't wait for him to kind of get on a roll late and kind of go on a serious run in the second half, like he did last year and, and try and do the free agency thing over again. Has Montgomery and Snell's uh, situations this year changed the way you think about free agency? No, cause I think I'm just in a totally different spot than those guys. They're, they're just totally different pitchers, um, different agents, different situations. Um, I'm not, there's obviously a, there's obviously the, the minor threat, you know, that free agency doesn't go the way that you had hoped, which is kind of, you know, it's just out there, but um, I'm more concerned on having a really good season this year and, and kind of being able to enjoy the free agency period. And, and, you know, Molly and I can choose where we, you know, where we want to go would, would be the best feeling. So um, hasn't really changed my feelings that I'm very excited about the process, but the only reason I can be really excited is if I have a really good season. So at this point, that's the most important thing. If I give a really good story for my agent to tell, then it's going to be a really fun spring training, or it's going to be a fun off season. All right. Well, I, well, we do appreciate you kind of take us inside that world because there's a lot of us that just don't know the thought process of it. So we, we appreciate that. Um, when you got to Arizona, I imagine you dreamt about being on the mound when your team makes the World Series, but you actually got to live it out. Um, why don't we give a little listen to, and just in case you you don't remember the last out against the Philadelphia Phillies, uh, here we go. Wall to strike away. Here he comes. Cave a fly ball to right field over his Carroll. He's got it, and the Arizona Diamondbacks are headed to the World Series for the second time in their 26-year history. They have upset the Philadelphia Phillies. You got quite a smile on your face right now. What are you thinking about? Just that's one of my that's one of the best days of my life, and probably. Probably my favorite baseball moment I've ever had. That was that was really special. That was a really special day. You look like you're emotional about it. Just a lot of a lot of hard work and just you think about, you know, it's not the ring that I'm gonna be, you know, we we got the piece of jewelry this offseason. It's not that I'll it's I'll remember every single moment of that playoff run being unpredictable. Um the guys who stepped up like Brandon fought in game seven and just like I'll just embrace the people that I got to share that experience with. And, you know, forever, forever, we will be Diamondbacks royalty because of that moment. And, and that was pretty, that was pretty special. And, and just, you know, I had pitched so poorly in the postseason the year before to, uh, you know, it didn't go well after that, but be, up until that point to, to dominate was, was pretty special just personally as well. You mentioned the ring uh, ceremony. I think you guys had it in late March, maybe that first series at home. Um, there are a lot of people who say, why in the world are you celebrating a runner-up finish? Like, that's not what we do. How do you feel about it? There's only been 100 people who have finished second in the history of baseball, right? Like, there's only been 100 winners. There's only been 100, you know, second-place teams, second or pennant winners. So um, to discount winning the pennant would feel would feel just ridiculous. It's uh, It's an incredible achievement. We as a team – deserve to be to be recognized for that and and it's something very very special it you know i I, i've said it you ask the dodgers and the braves if they would have liked to have lost the world series i you know they probably would have and i think their fans fan base would have would have liked to have lost the world series it's a pretty special moment of course we want to be where the rangers were last year the goal is obviously to win the world series but to come up second out of 30 teams is is a pretty special thing and and to feel like just because you didn't reach your goal you shouldn't 
shouldn't uh, shouldn't embrace that is is kind of silly in my in my perspective. You know, you're a lot like a, a defensive back. In fact, I think it's even tougher emotionally, right? Because you know that at the end of the day, you're going to have a lot of great moments, but there's days where the other guy's going to get you, right? I mean, when you come into one run games, a bloop and a blast, and it's over like that, right? And so that happened in the World Series with Seager. I'm curious, was it different because it happened in the playoffs or was it the same emotion as if it had happened on July 17th? Um, I would say 95 of it, 95% of it is the same emotion as it would, you know, if I did that tonight. Um, 5% of it was like, I can't believe that was in the World Series that I did that. Like, um, so I still haven't even wrapped my head. I at some point I'll be able to just sit down and think about that, that whole playoff run and, and go into the world series. But it just kind of was so fat. Everything was moving so fast and just, you're just trying to embrace it. And, um, I haven't even really thought about the fact that, you know, it was the world series and, and you see all these clips from, you know, from every world series. I remember as a kid, I, re, you know, I can just think of all these big moments and it's like some little kid is going to be thinking of that Seeger Homer as one of their, you like one of their moments they remember that they were watching on their couch. And it's disappointing that I was on the, the receiving end of that, unfortunately, but it's just, it's just part of the game. And, and um, still wouldn't, have, I wouldn't trade that experience for anything in the world. It was, it was fantastic. Hey everybody, John Boy Media and iHeart Podcast have teamed up. So you're probably thinking, Rose, what in the world are you talking about? I mean, the two of your favorite John Boy Media shows can now be found over at the Dan Patrick Show, in addition to where you already watch and listen. That's right. Wake and Jake and Jimmy's Three Things, they have joined the iHeart Podcast and the Dan Patrick Show family. And the best part, they'll still continue to be the very same shows that you know and love. This is a big deal for us. Why Dan Patrick has been one of the biggest names in the history of sports media certainly over the last 35 to 40 years. And for us to be in a partnership with him, that is unbelievable. Obviously, we're super excited about it. You should be excited about it as well. And we couldn't do cool stuff like this if it wasn't for your support. Thank you very much. You were banged up at the beginning of this year, which meant you missed the return trip to Seattle, I believe. Did you make the trip or, or were you back in Arizona? I did not. So I that was my goal. That was my goal when I got injured was to try and get there. Um I was just, I was at like the 90% mark and it just didn't feel like, I was like, I'm not, I'm not ready to go. And I, I was planning on going, even if I wasn't going to pitch, I was going to go um, to see everybody and, and essentially thank them. Like, you know, I was very appreciative of my time there. Uh, but it just kind of felt like I'm not, I'm not going to pitch, you know, the next game either. I just, I was just, I was just short of being able to be ready. It was disappointing that I couldn't make the trip because I just wanted, even if I, didn't pitch just to see everybody, but um, the timing just didn't work, unfortunately. That's too bad because I would have liked to have seen, like, I love this moment this week where Corey Seager came back to Los Angeles and in the first game he didn't play, but it was his first opportunity outside of an all-star game here where he had to, you know, tip his cap and they put a big, like, I would have liked to have seen. Now, it doesn't mean it won't happen next year wherever, if you're playing for Arizona or somebody else, that if you get up to Seattle, it's not going to happen, but I imagine you probably thought a little bit about that. Yeah, I was bummed. I was bummed. I I had been really excited about going back. I, especially the first time, like, you know, just be different, you know, if I go next year or if it's like two years from now or something, it'll just feel different that it wasn't right away. But, um, so I was, I was really disappointed that that, you know, the timing of that worked really poorly. Um, unfortunately, but it's just, there's nothing I could do. Um, I tried everything I could to be as healthy as quickly as I could. And, I am healthy now and that's the most important thing. And, you know, everyone was like, it's not one week, one week extra trying to rush something to get, you know, like you said, in a free agency year to try and rush something so that I'm, you know, there to pitch in Seattle, but I'm not a hundred percent would have been, would have been stupid. It would have been irresponsible. So disappointing, but I, uh, you know, I still talk to anybody I need to over there and that's the most important thing. Uh, I don't know if I should call you, uh, Paul, P.S. or M.J. based on the T-shirt that you were uh, wore when you came back, it said, "I'm back." Is that now? Look at this. Uh, yeah. That is that is Jordan esque minus the fax machine. It's 2024 version of it. Yeah. Well, where'd you? Where the heck do you get this? So I, you know, full disclosure, I got it in spring training for the first day in Seattle. I was going to wear it. I was going to wear it when I was going back to Seattle for the first time. And then I got injured. I didn't go. And I was like, 
well, I guess I'm going to wear it the first day I come back. So um, it was kind of just, it's a little silly thing. Anyone who is my age and maybe a little older that, you know, kind of remember Jordan, it, you know, it was just kind of an ode to him and um, just wanted to make sure it was a special moment of like, hey, I'm back. Like, it's exciting. And, um, you know, anyone who's watched the documentary knows that that's like a, that's a pretty cool spot in that when he comes back and, and then he starts to dominate. Dude, imagine like I was working in the sports industry and we were like, what? Like people, you know, like the world stopped and everybody's like, he just faxed it back to the league office. And all it said was, I'm back. Like that is the biggest baller move in the history of sports. I, I don't have the balls to do that for real. It's kind of just like as a joke <laughs> to Jordan, but that that is pretty sick. Yes. Were you a Jordan guy growing up? Oh, I was a I was a Laker guy, but I was so I was a little bit young to be like really have watched him. I do remember I remember being at my grandparents' house watching his last shot against against the Jazz, kind of like still in awe of the fact that he was you know that he was MJ. But I was a little young to have like kind of watched the the runs that he had. Uh, but it's kind of it's almost like for me younger is almost like he's like a myth almost, just a myth of the greatest player of all time. So. I kind of I try to make sure that I I pay respects to to the goat. I was at the shot May seventh, nineteen eighty nine, against the Cavs. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, As a Cleveland one, guy, I know that still hurts. Section one thirty one, row T, seat sixteen. That's too bad. I was also at the drive by John Elway. Cleveland people are going to stop letting you go to games. Yeah, they pretty much have. Like, organizations want nothing to do with me. Did you go to any of the NBA Finals games when they, that year that they won? So, it's very interesting because games, game seven was in Golden State. Yep. And my wife said it was Father's Day of 2016. Okay. She said, she said should we go to the game? My kids looked and said, you cannot go to the game. Because <laughs> if you go and we lose, we will hold it against you forever based on your history. No joke. Like, we had a big discussion about whether or not we should fly up there. Okay. And they said, absolutely not. So we ended up having a big cookout Father's Day here. There were like 15 people. We ended up winning it. That was pretty special. Then my follow-up question, did you feel confident – enough to go to a World Series game that year after that, or no? So, um, don't know if you heard, I used to work at uh, Major League Baseball Network, yep. did a show, yep. uh, Intentional Talk, yeah, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. Uh, so, I had to be there. Now, okay. Um, okay. I, prom I, prom I promised my kids, I said, if it gets back to Cleveland for game six and seven, I will fly you in. And okay. sure enough, it happened to coincide with our oldest son's 16th birthday. So I flew them in for game six. We got our balls kicked in that day. Game seven, we're down six to one. We end up coming back. The Rajay Davis homer, the place. If there had been, if that had been a dome, the roof would have blown off. That's how yeah, loud it I was. Believe it. I believe it. We ended up losing. Yes. My youngest son, who was um, had just turned 11 at the time, we're walking out of the stadium. He's holding my hand. We're walking back to the hotel crushed. He looks up and he goes, Dad, it sucks we lost, but at least we were there together. Your tear flew down your eye for sure. For sure. I mean, it was yeah. like I look at him now and here he, here he is 18 years old with a full beard. And I look at him and he's still <laughs> that little 11-year-old kid that yeah. has me crying. So Absolutely. It goes back to what good. I said. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't trade. I wouldn't trade my World Series experience for anything other than being on the winning side of that. I, I, it's, it was incredible, and, and it was special the way it went down. Even if it went down, uh, not the Diamondbacks' way. It's just it was you know the World Series is incredible whether you win or lose. Obviously, we want to win, but um, it was a special moment no matter what. So I under I understand his sentiment. And think of it this way: in uh, in 2043. When they bring you guys back for the 20th reunion, and there's some guys who have bellies and some guys who have no hair and all that stuff, <laughs> you will always have that run together. I mean, it is yes. amazing. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, um, I want to ask you a few more things before we let you hit the road here. Uh, Paul Skeens has been the talk of baseball. Um, because you're on a, a different time zone, 
Have you been able to watch him at all? Yeah. So we have the same agent. So I obviously have like a little bit of extra incentive to kind of like, kind of be focused on him. And I've obviously kind of followed him a little bit over the last, was that like 18 months or so since he's really, he's really come on the scene. He's just, he's, he's really incredible. He's going to be, I don't think it's going to take long until you put him up there in that, like that top 10, top 20 list of pitchers in baseball. Um, just an electric, electric fastball. And at the end of the day, you have to get people out with your fastball in this league more than anything. And, and when you have a plus plus one, it definitely makes it a lot easier for you. So, um, I'm hoping we manage to skip him in our two series against Pittsburgh. But, um, if we don't, then it'll be, you know, it's fun for me to watch the first couple innings in the, in the clubhouse, um, and kind of see, but he's, he's very, very impressive. He's been, he's been everything advertised and more so far. So um, we've had this discussion on the other podcast I do with Trevor Plouffe called Baseball Today, whether or not he is deserving of an all-star berth. Let's assume that his June goes the way that his May has and, and the beginning of July, and he's got 10 or 11 starts under his belt. Yeah. yeah. Would you be okay as a veteran, a guy who's grinded to get to where you are if he makes the all-star team? Yeah, so the All Stars team is is kind of a weird scenario. So for people who don't know, uh, the fans can pick who starts the game, but the the Major League Baseball will pick every other person. Um, it's not up to the it's not up to the manager anymore. So Tory doesn't get a vote in this this year. Um, Major League Baseball will pick every team has to have somebody who's on the All Star is on the All Star team, which I think is important. I think it's an important thing. It shouldn't be all, you know, one team going to the All Star game. Every team should be represented for their fan base. I don't I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna say honestly, I don't know a ton about the Pirates organization. Mm-hmm. They're not our division. They're not in our time. It's very difficult for me to make sure that I follow along. But from an outsider's perspective, I'm not sure I have anybody else who is more deserving on their team to make it. And the All-Star game is just a showcase for the fans. Like I said, the fans pick who starts in the game. So this is for the fans. What more? What would be more electric than watching Paul Skeens throw? I don't know what he could reach in one inning. Could he, could he reach 102, 103? Like, it would be kind of fun to watch him pitch an inning. I, I don't think I'd have any issue with that. You know, that doesn't mean he's going to be a Hall of Famer. But at the end of the day, he's probably the best representative for the Pirates next month's All-Star game. Right? And that's, that's my perspective. What do you think? Yeah, I've said yes. It's called the All Star Game, and our job is to get as many as many eyeballs on this as possible. And you right. want to have as many like in recent years. Unfortunately, we've had guys that have been banged up; they haven't been able to play. Some of the biggest names in the sport, like you're not going to have Garrett Cole in the All Star Game. I think that right. stinks. So yes, I mean if it's close or whatever, like. Dude, who doesn't want to watch Paul Skeens pitch at this point? Some people are like, oh, I'm already Paul Skeens out. I'm like, are you kidding me? The guy's thrown six times, and he's been freaking unbelievable. What, what is it that you want? They're going to have a miserable decade because I don't think he's going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I mean, what? I, yeah, I mean, the point is to have the best baseball players on the planet play each other in one game, right? And I would say Paul Skeens is probably one of the best baseball players on the planet. Why wouldn't you want to see him throw – bullets for an inning. Like, I mean, everyone remembers when Verlander was throwing, you know, he used to throw like 92, 94, 96, and then he would go to a hundred and then he just pitched the all-star game. It was just a hundred every pit. Like that's not fun. Like everyone, everyone gets excited when the scoreboard lights up, you wouldn't want to see him. Um, and that's no offense to maybe Mitch Keller probably might be more deserving. I, you know, I haven't taken a deep look into their numbers, but um, like I said, the fans pick who starts the game. So like, this isn't a real game. It's just for the fans. I, I can't imagine I can't imagine you wouldn't want him in the All-Star game just to see what it's all about. Um, you guys don't get a vote, right? Or you do? So we used to get a vote. I, I'm now I need to get I need to get more information on this because I was just told Tori does not get to pick alternates. So I we have always been able to vote the kind of like the next 10 people onto the team. Um, but it'll be interesting to see because it's very difficult because most of the people pick the people who are already nominated. So, um, it, yeah, like I've always picked the three best players that I think are more deserving. I, I don't necessarily pick like, oh, I need a Pirates guy or I need a Rockies guy in my vote. I've always, I've always voted for who I thought deserved to be in it more than anything. All right. I got two other things. I'm going to let you go back be dad, U.S. Open viewer and, and Diamondbacks pitcher because I do appreciate your time. One is, 
I feel like almost weekly on my daily podcast, we're talking about the umpiring. I don't want to get you in trouble, but is it different than when you first came in the league? I'll say I probably get more strikes than I did when I came into the league. Um, I don't necessarily think, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I, as a pitcher, I kind of understand the strike zone, but I'm not, I'm obviously not as close as the hitters or as the catchers or the, or the umpires. I don't think it's any worse. I think we could all, I, I do, you know, we have, we have our thoughts. We had a meeting with Rob Manfred when we went to New York a couple of weeks ago, he came in and, and, um, you know, we just want the best version of the game we can get. Right. So, um, I think more than anything, we just need some sort of accountability. These guys are not held accountable um, for their actions is kind of the problem, right? There's no relegation system. There's no, um, there's essentially like some of these guys are not good and there's no punishment. And I'm not speaking, I'm speaking for five to 10%, right? This is, I don't think this is an issue across the league. I just think there's some that are awful and then there's some that are fantastic and we're trying to figure out how can we get the fantastic ones behind the plate more often? Or how can we give some sort of punishment for not being, you know, for being the bottom 10% every year? And then you have guys in AAA who are getting really good, especially with the ABS system. And it's like, we just want, we just want the best system out there, I think is more than anything. Um, and we just want the best umpires in the world to be out there. Think about, think about, and you're not old. I'm not saying this about your age, but think about your eyesight now versus when you were like 16. Like you just don't have the same eyes. If you're 75, you shouldn't be behind the home plate. You just shouldn't be. You like my parents don't. My my dad can't see the way he did when he was 25. He shouldn't be. He there's no way he could be a major league umpire. Your eyesight's just not as good. And guys are throwing 100 mile an hour bullets that are moving all over the plate. Like. There just needs to be a better system in place that we get the guys who are the best behind the plate as, as often as we possibly can. Uh, I am not taking offense to it because last night we were eating dinner. We have like a big counter in our kitchen, and that's usually where we eat and we're watching games. And I said, Josh, what is the count? I can't see the count. And I had to put <laughs> on my glasses while I was eating dinner, which I never do. And I was like, oh, so it's too like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, so I am going to automatically disqualify myself from working behind home plate anytime soon. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, this is, the games are just too important to have missed calls like this. And, you know, it, we need to have the best available back there. And sometimes I don't feel like we do that. And that's part of, that's, I think, part of all of our issues is that we have guys that are good. We need those guys back there as often as possible. Now, they're going to take offense, right? If you're not, one of the best umpires and they say, Hey, you're just on the bases, the series. They're going to take offense to that, but this is part of just the system, right? I'm graded every time I go out there. If I stop producing, I am going to get released. There's no punishment for these guys. And they just take their turns around the bases and then they get home plate. And you know, some of these guys, you just flip a coin on your, on your at bats. You just have no idea what you're going to get. You've walked out there not knowing where the strike zone is because Joe umpires behind the home plate. You're like, well, this guy sucks, so it doesn't matter what I do. We get umpires scorecards, and I can see who's who's better and who's worse. And it's like, oh, all right. I'm like, you got to make sure they swing today. That sucks. It's just part of the deal. It's just part of the deal. It's unfortunate, but it's like that's that's why we need a better system. And I and you know, to Rob's credit, he you know he addressed some of our questions and, and kind of gave us a few of the answers that aren't they're not necessarily public information, but um, he understands that it's a concern as well. And and you know, it's we need the best version of our game, and sometimes with the umpiring, we don't have the best version of our game. All right, last thing, and I'm going to let you go. I promise. Give us a daily Paul Seawald. Like I don't even know what you do. You said I'm hanging out in the clubhouse in the beginning of the game. Like just take us through. The closer's day. Okay. So I'll get there. So we have a 640 game today. I'll get there about 2 o'clock, spend an hour of kind of like activation, warm-up, stretching, kind of get the body going. The older I get, the more time I need in there just to get going. Uh, we'll do throwing program today. And then after throwing program, we'll shag a little bit of BP. Then we'll kind of do our, our advanced scouting report. We'll go over every hitter for who we played, the White Sox today. Um and then that'll give us, that's about two hours before game time. That's a little bit of time to like, we have an amazing recovery center. We have, you know, red light therapy. We have hot, hot 
tubs, cold tubs. We have uh, temp beds and, and chairs to kind of. So the older I get, the more stuff, more time I use the recovery stuff, and the less time I spend, you know, playing cards. But that's just part of the deal. And then have some dinner, and then I always go out for the anthem, do the anthem. It's game time, first pitch. I'll come in, and I have like the Norma Tech recovery sleeves for my for my legs. Um, and then I, then I go and do like a mini, like activation and warm up so, or workout. It's nothing crazy. It's kind of like some med balls, some like ab stuff, some like jumping, trying to like, cause you think it's been three o'clock is when I throw. And then I don't really do a ton physical until nine o'clock when I pitch. So that yeah, it has to be a little bit sometime in between. So it's kind of like at seven o'clock is like, all right, it's time to like get my body going again with a little mini warm up. Um, and then I go out there and pray we have a, uh, less than three run lead. So I get out there. <laughs> I know it's been sporadic for you lately. Um, you're the best. You always take us to, you always take us to really interesting places with our discussions. I really appreciate it. Uh, best of luck to you and the diamondbacks An early happy father's day to you and your entire family. Enjoy that. Now with two kids, which is awesome. And I'll catch up with you later in the year. How's that sound? I appreciate it, Chris. Love it. We'll do it. Uh, we'll do it again in the second half. Always appreciate it. Thank you, Paul Seewald of the Arizona Diamondbacks, the defending National League champions. Big shout out to our producer, Robbie Scirocco, our intern, Tommy Young, as well. For Paul Seewald of the Arizona Diamondbacks, I am Chris Rose. We'll see you next time here on the Chris Rose Rotation, a production of John Boy Media.